So the year is 2050. You're driving to visit your friend who lives at the other end of the city. Or more likely, you're being driven by your car. It's fully automated, so all you have to do is relax and enjoy the ride. You get bored, so you decide to play a game and start counting delivery drones flying over you. 35, 36, 37... Ah, the traffic lights change to white, and you know exactly what to do. Yes, traffic lights of the future could have an extra color, white. This artificially intelligent light is supposed to make passing through intersections easier for self-driving vehicles, help traffic flow faster, and reduce fuel consumption. The green light will still mean go. The red light will still say stop. And the white light will be a signal for human drivers and passengers to follow the vehicles in front of them going through the intersection. The self-driven cars won't have to see the white traffic light. They will get data from it wirelessly within a certain range. The system will recommend an optimal speed and give priority to the road with more traffic on it. The white light will activate when there are enough self-driving cars approaching the intersection. The computer will then figure out the most efficient order for them to go or stop. And if this new type of traffic light is introduced before we completely switch to autonomous vehicles, there will still be old cars on the road. When they outnumber the self-driven ones at the intersection, the white light will switch off by itself. Running simulations of the new tech showed that the more self-driven cars there are on the road, the faster the traffic is going. We still don't have the tech to introduce the white light at every intersection. But researchers at North Carolina State University, who are behind the idea, believe it's possible. It would take money and time, but would also help save money and time in the long run. If you're impressed by the fourth color on the traffic light, imagine augmented reality right in your vehicle. Road signs and traffic alerts will pop up on your windshield like a sci-fi movie. There could also be custom notifications, apps, and entertainment. Looks like you'll never be bored on the highway again. And neither will your car, since it will communicate with others of its kind via a vehicle-to-vehicle or V2V system. Cars will exchange data on speed, location, and safety warnings to make the right driving decisions. Roadworks, although done for your own good and safety, can be pretty frustrating. Well, there might be no need for that with self-repairing roads. Researchers from several British universities have created a concrete blend with tiny capsules full of special bacteria. These capsules come from lakes near volcanoes and can survive for up to 200 years without oxygen and food. They activate their healing superpowers when they come in contact with water, which is the main cause of potholes. After feeding on water, the bacteria produce limestone, which seals up the imperfections on the roads. Tests have shown this brilliant idea actually works. Wow! When this tech goes global, it should reduce road maintenance costs by 50%. It's especially good news for motorists and cyclists, as potholes are a huge danger to them. Now, many highways already have cameras observing them from above, But drivers and self-driving vehicles need to get access to that data. In the not-so-distant future, sensors will be pretty much everywhere – in vehicles, buildings, traffic lights, and even the roads themselves. It's important because even some of the smartest cars may have a limited range of what they see. If they make decisions based on that data, it's no good. So a smart highway with sensors will come to the rescue. Imagine getting real-time information about all the potential obstacles and hazards on the road via fast cellular-based 5G networks. This tech should help minimize the number of road accidents. If an accident does happen on one of the smart highways, artificial intelligence will analyze the data on speed, lane positioning, and nearby vehicles to work out some patterns and algorithms to avoid similar accidents in the future. Since more and more people will use shared autonomous vehicles, the demand for parking spots should go down. And there will be parking lots for autonomous vehicles with electric charging stations and cleaning services. Such parking lots will fit more cars since they won't need elevators or staircases. The owners will just drop the cars off at the entrance. 
It also means the cars can be parked super tightly. People won't have to open the doors and climb out of the vehicle. Researchers believe that autonomous parking lots could fit 62 to 87 percent more cars than old school ones. The only problem is those drivers who won't want to pay for parking and send their self-driving cars cruising endlessly. This could cause robotic gridlocks. Talk about future world problems. Now, if you use public transportation, and it often makes you feel, well, a bit frustrated, you're going to love this one. Trains, buses, ferries, and whatever vehicles we might see in the future will no longer travel on fixed routes or schedules. The number of vehicles will depend on user demand. The idea here is to reduce waiting times and crowds. This system, called Demand Responsive Transport, or DRT for short, is already tested at different locations around the globe. It doesn't always go smoothly, but new tech is supposed to solve all the problems. Apps and mapping algorithms will help you book shuttle minibus rides from floating bus stops near your home and take you where you need to go. Do you sometimes wish you could have bought a different colored car? Well, the great news is that your vehicle might be able to change its looks in the future. BMW presented a concept car that can do just that at the 2023 Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. The car will have 240 panels on it that can change into 32 different colors. You'll be able to choose to change all the panels to one color or set a shade for each panel, turning your car into a kaleidoscope on wheels. The car will also have a windshield with augmented reality, with all the necessary data on the trip and social media updates, which should soothe any FOMO issues. And your prospective vehicle will also express emotions using a combo of headlights and closed kidney grills. I guess if you take good care of it, it will smile all the time. You've definitely seen a flying car in at least one movie about the future, and that future is getting closer. Several companies have been working on it, and Aska is so far the closest to launching it. It's already taking pre-orders for a four-seater the size of an SUV that can take off vertically and cover distances up to 250 miles at the speed of up to 150 miles per hour. Its manufacturers promise that the flying car will have no problem blending into the city. It doesn't need a lot of space to land and take off and can be parked at regular parking lots. Its engine will use premium gas you can buy at regular gas stations. You'll also need to recharge its battery, either at home or at special charging stations. That beauty can be yours for just $789,000, by the way. Hyundai has its own unique Elevate concept car, which has both wheels and legs. This transformer moves like regular cars can. It can climb stairs to help someone in a wheelchair get inside, fit into a tight parking spot, or climb over obstacles. The bigger idea behind this concept is to give freedom and mobility to those people who don't have it. Elevate can also help in construction work and disaster relief. Just imagine what a great help it could be to rescue teams trying to access areas where usual cars wouldn't be able to pass, like debris or pieces of collapsed buildings. Ah, the future is alive. Road trips are fun, but sometimes you find yourself stuck on the road for hours. There seems to be no reason. It's like a traffic jam coming out of nowhere to spoil your journey. Let's find out more about these mile-long car queues. You might ask, how bad could it be? The road will eventually be open. Some of the worst traffic jams might answer this question on my behalf. In American history, traffic jams can be traced back to the 60s. In 1969, the Music and Arts Festival was held in New York. Way more people commuted to the festival than the festival organizers had expected. In the end, cars got stuck for eight hours on the New York State Thruway. In 2005, around 2.5 million people needed to evacuate from Texas due to a natural phenomenon. Since everyone gets in their cars around the same time, they collectively create 100-mile-long congestion on an interstate highway. It took nearly two days to open the road again. In the winter of 2011, a blizzard hit Chicago, Illinois. The snow caused multiple major accidents. 
people ended up spending more than 12 hours in their vehicles. Their cars were buried in the snow. It looked like a scene from a movie. Of course, traffic jams are not joy destroyers unique to the US. In 1980, hundreds of people in France created an almost 110 mile long jam. What happens if hundreds of people return from a ski holiday around the same time? A huge traffic jam that gets into the Guinness World Records forms. Drivers had to drive slowly because of bad weather conditions. After this stressful experience, they probably crawled for another vacation. Hmm, maybe massage therapy to loosen their muscles? Another world record comes from Sao Paulo. Imagine being trapped in the car for 180 miles. This case belongs to 2009, but heavy traffic is a big problem for the city in general. Regardless of the day or time, the city always has congestion on some roads. Los Angeles shares the same destiny as Sao Paulo. The city isn't just famous for Hollywood and other gorgeous amenities. It's also a place where you can experience the world's longest rush hour. So much so that the average time a driver spends in traffic delays is around 100 hours per year. Blizzards, extreme fog, or accidents are solid reasons for traffic jams, but sometimes there's no obvious reason. First, traffic slows down, then it stops entirely. It can take hours or only minutes for the cars to move again. Suddenly, you're driving in an open lane like Lightning McQueen. Was there a road construction or, I don't know, tons of apples spilled on the road from a truck? There are multiple causes of traffic jams. It starts with us humans. Apparently, the driver's reaction time affects the size and formation of traffic jams. If the driver fails to perceive and respond at the correct time, the traffic gets inconsistent. One driver's delayed reaction affects the others. This creates an accordion effect. Studies reveal that the human factor significantly affects congestion. Around 650,000 drivers are using their cell phones while driving. This is one of the reasons the perception and response time of drivers drops. Bad driving behavior can lead to phantom traffic jams. The roads are haunted by supernatural creatures. I'm kidding. I'll get to the phantom traffic jams later on. Even though we keep our eyes off the phone or ignore the thoughts in our heads, we cannot magically make every driver react at the same speed, for instance. For that, we can get help from technology. Self-driving cars can comply with slowdowns more accurately compared to us. In theory, these types of cars can be effective in solving this problem. Is it just humans that cause the traffic? No, sometimes computers make errors and traffic signs stop working. Other times, green lights don't hold on for enough time. You stop at the red lights, four cars in front of you make a turn, and boom, the light turns to red. Here comes a cue. There are engineering errors too. Some traffic areas are overdeveloped. There, the mass transit system is already overcrowded, but the road system is inadequate for the demand. More obvious reasons, such as poor weather conditions and accidents, also block the traffic. Some routes lack public transportation options, so people had to hop into the car to reach their destination. Oh, and you can add construction work, lane closure, or double parking blockage to the list. Now we can talk about phantom traffic jams. Imagine you're on an already busy road. One driver brakes harshly to avoid hitting the car in front of it. This driver didn't follow a simple rule, safe stopping distance. You should leave room in between the cars before and after you. If people see the traffic density ahead, they should take their foot off the speed pedal at the right time. That can prevent traffic jams from arising. If one person waits until the last second to break, they slow everyone down. This chain reaction can also be formed by a bump in the road too. One car brakes and the one behind it brakes slightly more than it should have. What's more interesting is that even when cars get out of this traffic wave, the wave itself doesn't go away. It slowly drifts backwards against the direction of traffic. Japanese researchers experimented with this phenomenon. They put 22 drivers on a small circular road. Drivers went at the same speed and kept the same space between themselves. Anyway, even in this small and controlled circle, traffic waves formed. This experiment proved that individual drivers are an important factor in traffic blockage. Yet, 
behavioral change doesn't completely end phantom traffic jams. Studies show that even if all cars move following the exact same rules and not even one driver does anything wrong, these waves can still occur. But if there are enough cars on the highway, even if people use their best driving abilities, phantom traffic jams will form. Because we're humans and we can't eliminate the human error factor even if we wanted to. Is there a white light at the end of the road? Yes, there are some things engineers can do to make blockages go away. If the roads are straight and smooth, the risk of heavy traffic decreases. The drivers won't hit the brakes suddenly. Knowing this, engineers designed most highways as straight as possible. They also placed variable speed limits to cut down on these traffic jams. These types of speed limits are like chameleons. The maximum speed limit is displayed on electronic traffic signs and changes according to the weather and road conditions. Since the speed limit is flexible, the areas leading into a phantom traffic jam are also controlled. Drivers slow down gradually. People spend hours in traffic every day commuting to work. This is a waste of time, energy, and productivity. These jams surely cost time, but they're also expensive. Experts say that it costs the U.S. economy around $179 billion each year. If you're one of those people, here are must-have things in your car in case you get caught up in one. The most prominent personality of a traffic jam is you'll rarely know when it can happen. A first aid kit is a must for this occasion. The same thing applies to medicines. Snacks, yeah, you don't want to be starving in the middle of a highway. A chocolate bar can easily cheer you up in a traffic jam. You can add hand sanitizer and wet wipes to the list. A phone charger is also vital. It's important for communication, but also, you know, scrolling through Instagram or watching funny cat videos to boost your mood. Cushions, pillows, and blankets. You can take turns and nap for a while. Do you have a traffic jam memory that you want to erase from your brain forever? If so, tell us about it. You're walking down the street and notice a QR code right next to a parking meter. You have just parked your car, but for some reason, this QR code is grabbing all the attention. You think to yourself, hey, maybe this is how I pay for parking nowadays. You take out your phone and scan it. A link opens up and redirects you to a fishy-looking site that shows you where you have to pay and is asking you for a lot of money. There's no one around you to help, and you know for a fact this is not the price for two hours of parking. After going through the procedures, you look at your bank account and are in shock. They took a lot of your money. You call the bank to quickly freeze your account and ask them to help you get your money back. You scratch your head in confusion and look around you. Nobody seems to mind these QR codes scattered all over the city. You show them to other people in the city, and they're also surprised. QR codes stand for Quick Response Codes, since they're easy to scan and get info on something. It only takes seconds to get an insight on something or check out the menu at a restaurant. While this has been an awesome way to make our lives easier, some people are using it for the wrong reasons. Many experts warn about randomly scanning QR codes off the streets, since it may lead to scam websites where people can take your information and bank details and gain access to your credentials, just like what happened when you were trying to pay for parking. So that QR code that you scanned redirected you to a fake website where you handed out all your personal information, including banking details. The people behind this scam can now access your account and take out as much money as they want. They might even ask for more details, like your email and phone number, which you shouldn't give out unless you trust the source. You call someone to assist you for them to take down the QR code. On social media, you find out there are dozens of people who are also falling for this trick and losing their money. This is equally common for people who access public Wi-Fi hotspots. In settings like a cafe, airport, or public park, you always choose the Wi-Fi network that has the name of the place you're sitting in, like Free Wi-Fi Cafe, for example. Without thinking, you instantly connect to the router and are redirected to a page where they ask you to log in with your email, password, and other information about you. 
most of the hotspots are legit. But some belong to people who set up this hotspot to lure everyone in to give out their personal information. Once you enter their page, the people on the other side are watching you jot down everything they ask for. They even create a page where you have to fill in extra personal information about yourself, like addresses, place of work, and so on. The best way to properly avoid this is by asking anyone who can assist you and confirming whether or not you're connected to a safe Wi-Fi network. Or, if you frequently visit the place to do some remote work, always connect to the same Wi-Fi router even though the bad one that was set up has the same password and an identical landing page. You just can't trust anything in your inbox these days, especially not the emails that claim you just won something or that someone is contacting you for a fishy business proposal. Such emails are usually presented convincingly and make you think that they're real. But the best way to spot them is to pay attention to the details of the content. Check for spelling mistakes or style of writing. If it looks like there are some mistakes or weird and unprofessional writing, this can be a red flag. Also, check if the email signature exists. Most companies have an email signature with the person's job description and credentials to verify the source. These emails contain links that can redirect you to websites where the people who sent out these emails can get all your information. You should also pay attention to the ones sending you the emails to check if they are verified and come from a legitimate source. So, if the email ends with anything other than the company's name, this can also be a red flag. Sometimes people try to pretend they're someone you know, your boss or a co-worker or even your friend. They would write to you in a very convincing manner where you would think that they're actually sending you an email. These sorts of emails may not be real. You should check for the source and the content and verify with the person who sent it to you before replying or giving out any information. The targets usually include people who have high positions in large companies and corporations. They are considered the big fish in the game. Your emails also include links in which you can give out sensitive information which they can use against you. Protecting yourself online is not easy and requires a lot of concentration and hard work. There are many techniques that can make your sensitive data end up in the wrong hands. QR codes are just one example of misusage of new technology that is supposed to make your life easier. But don't worry, this doesn't mean that all QR codes are up to no good. Just like with every new piece of technology in the market, there will always be a way for it to be used for the wrong reasons. The internet, as we know it, is entering a new phase, Web 3.0. The internet was born in the 60s, when it was meant to connect computer devices to universities across the United States. Only four were initially used, but eventually, many other universities took part in this, and it stretched to Europe. After that, it was known as the internet. We saw the first promising years of the internet during the 90s, which was known as Web 1.0. It might sound complicated, but it just means that websites were static and users couldn't interact with them. Nonetheless, everyone knew that this would be the new way of communicating and gathering information. It was only a matter of time before people could upload content on the internet. Blogs, forums, comment sections, report pages, and messaging portals made it possible for people to interact with the websites they grew to love. Web 2.0 gave rise to popularity for modern-day social media, which made it easy for people to upload their own music and videos and stay connected with friends and family from all over the world. While this was an amazing achievement, some downsides were inevitable. It's easy for anyone to dig up information about anyone publicly online. In this day and age, online privacy is basically non-existent. But the main issue with Web 2.0 is that whenever someone uploads a piece of content, it does not technically belong to the user anymore. Web 3.0 is built around blockchain technology, and this will be the new and improved internet. Blockchain is a publicly accessible domain that shows transparent transactions for any user. This means that if you upload a piece of your artwork, they will know that you are the original creator. Nobody can claim your artwork as theirs. 
and this goes for anything that can be traded online. This will protect the content creator to the fullest. As of 2022, we're still in the early stages of this, and it's only going to get more interesting. Major corporations are developing metaverses, where people can transport themselves into virtual realities. In this world, you can socialize, buy stuff, and interact with the world around you. You can pick any avatar you want and wear anything you feel like. Hey, you want to dress up as an astronaut? (laughs) You can! You can go to different planets across the metaverse and meet all kinds of crazy-looking avatars. In the workplace, you can even attend different meetings with co-workers to discuss work-related stuff while physically sitting at home. Gaming will also be elevated to a brand new experience where players are immersed in a world where they can be anyone or anything. This will be the future that we will get to witness in the coming years. So tonight, go out and look at the moon through a telescope and you'll see many craters. No one still knows how they appeared there. Some of them have formed recently. Scientists have discovered a double crater on the moon that appeared for a strange reason. In March, a rocket crashed into the moon, and no one knows who owned it and why it left such a trail. If a regular rocket had fallen there, it would have left one hole. A standard space rocket has a heavy engine on one side and a lighter fuel tank on the other. But this time, there had to be two heavy sides on one rocket to leave a double crater. That's strange. No one knows what it is, and no one has claimed to be the owner. It was probably part of a large 3-ton rocket. This piece had been flying in space for several years. At first, astronomers thought it belonged to SpaceX, but the company denied this claim. Also, they thought that China had launched the rocket, but this was also wrong. In the near future, NASA experts hope to find out the truth. The problem with tracking such rockets and space debris is that this is quite expensive. Companies don't want to spend too much money on it. But soon, this will change. People will have to spend billions of dollars to monitor garbage or destroy it, since it's getting too crowded in space. Space companies will have to solve this problem, as it poses a serious danger to satellites and spacecraft. Just take a look. There are millions of pieces of satellites and rockets flying in space. Some of them are the size of a basketball, others are as tiny as a raindrop. The total weight of all this debris is about 9,000 tons. This is almost 2,000 tons heavier than the Eiffel Tower. Okay, all this garbage is floating there, so what? The problem is that it's not just floating. It's moving at a speed of 17,500 miles per hour. A tennis ball will fall apart into several pieces at such a speed on the surface of our planet because of air resistance. But there's no air in space. Nothing prevents a tiny piece of metal from reaching a speed 20 times faster than the speed of sound. A piece of paint at this speed can easily damage the casing of a spaceship. Once, several shuttle portholes were replaced because of the damage caused by flying chunks of paint. Now imagine what a piece of metal the size of a basketball can do to a spaceship. It could bring down the International Space Station. Many satellites were destroyed by space debris that crashed into them. And when those satellites exploded, they burst into thousands of small parts, which also turned into dangerous flying objects. For example, in 1996, a fragment of a rocket damaged 10 years earlier crashed into a French satellite. In 2009, a failed spacecraft destroyed another commercial ship. As a result of the collision, about 2,300 tracked fragments appeared, as well as lots of tiny untracked ones. Today, satellite operators receive warnings about potential collisions with space debris. But these messages are often either inaccurate or reach the operators too late. Imagine that a screw is flying at great speed toward your satellite. You'll hardly have time to dodge it. Perhaps it won't hit your satellite at all. This uncertainty makes these warning sensors useless. The problem becomes much more serious when it concerns the ISS crew members. A durable spacesuit can't guarantee protection from flying debris. And the station itself is too large to save itself from big objects by dodging. To keep astronauts safe, scientists have a catalog of things that are the size of softballs or bigger. They monitor thousands of fragments and analyze their trajectories, material, and dimensions. Next, they use the pizza box method to dodge garbage. 
This is the unofficial name for an imaginary square that is used to calculate the risks of a collision with space debris. So imagine a giant pizza box. It is 2.5 miles deep, 30 miles wide, and 30 miles long. Now put the entire International Space Station in this box. Yeah, okay, you can have it with pepperoni. Anyway, if some space object is heading toward the edge of the box, the crew will begin to develop a plan of action. The box's radius is quite large compared to the station, since it's difficult to calculate the debris's trajectory. If there's a chance that something might approach the box, then it can also damage the station. When operators receive a signal about approaching debris, they analyze it. Depending on the data received, the crew begins to act in a certain way. If it's something small and heading for some part of the ISS, the astronaut should evacuate from this part. And after that, they'll do repairs there. If something big is approaching, the entire station can perform an evasive maneuver with the help of the engines or a docked spacecraft. One such trick required about five hours of hard work. The station is a big, clumsy ship, so it's important to know about the threat in advance. From 1999 to 2020, the ISS made 29 maneuvers to avoid collisions. Three of them occurred in 2020. And there will be more since the amount of garbage increases. If some object is too big and fast and can damage critical components and it's impossible to dodge, the entire crew will have to evacuate. In the future, NASA and other space agencies will have to think about how to destroy this debris or remove it from orbit. One option is catching everything with extensive space nets. One agency suggested developing a solar sail that clings to debris and propels it to a low orbit. Another wanted to use an electrodynamic cable to slow down the speed of space debris with the current. This maneuver will cause space garbage to move toward the surface of Earth and burn up in the atmosphere. But what if one of these pieces still reaches the ground? Even now, many satellite parts fall on Earth. Fortunately, this is not so dangerous. The probability of cosmic garbage falling on your house is minimal. In addition, 70% of our planet is covered with water. Of the remaining 30%, only 3-10% to are occupied by people. Almost all space debris falls into the ocean or unpopulated parts of dry land. But let's say some part of a satellite damages your property. In that case, the company that owns this space object will cover the losses. Such cases are rare and occur because of accidents in orbit. But sometimes, companies intentionally abandon their satellites. If a spacecraft is out of order, they turn it off and use the remaining fuel to slow it out of orbit and drop it in a safe place. Almost all such objects fall in the region of the spacecraft cemetery. It's located at the most remote point on Earth, Point Nemo. It's in the southern Pacific Ocean, east of New Zealand. The nearest island is more than a thousand miles away. The distance to the International Space Station is much smaller. It's challenging to get to this place since no ships travel there. That's why most satellites end up in that area. It looks like an endless sea. The ocean there absorbs explosive waves of any power without consequences. Even if some fallen ship or rocket causes a giant wave, it dissipates long before it reaches dry land. Fish and other marine creatures are also not at risk. Point Nemo is one of the least inhabited areas on Earth. Underwater currents carry nutrients through the ocean, and tiny living creatures such as photoplankton and other organisms feed on them. But these currents don't reach Point Nemo. Another way to deliver nutrients in the ocean is wind. But there's almost no wind at Point Nemo. This place doesn't have enough food to let large life forms develop. Just imagine how lonely and silent it is there. Sometimes, a broken rocket breaks the silence, crashing into the water at great speed and descending to the seabed, where thousands of other satellites are waiting to welcome it.